Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we're continuing in our series on the importance of the local church. This morning we're looking at lesson number 10, the accrediting of the Lord's local assemblies. What do I mean when I talk about the Lord accrediting his local assembly? The idea to accredit means to give proof of the validity of something. In other words, when the Lord accredits his assembly, he's giving us proof that his assembly is truly the house of worship that he has chosen for us to have. So as we look at our lesson this morning, we're going to find that the Lord has given us proof that the local church is his house of worship, and he's also given us proof that the message of the local church is his genuine message that he has given to be declared to men throughout the earth. Let's begin by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find teaching on how the Lord has proven to us his local church is the house of worship that he has chosen for us to use and the message of the local church is the truth that comes from God's word. In 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> in verses 1 through 3, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Here in the first three verses of this chapter, Paul is setting the scene for the rest of the chapter. What Paul is teaching is this. We have to be careful and recognize that not only does God's word exist in this world, but those who falsely proclaim error exist in the word, world as well. We have to be able to discern between the true teaching of God and error. Not only that, we have to discern between the true worship place of God and other organizations that are not sanctioned by God. Here is one of the great indicators of how we can tell the truth, how we can tell the difference between those who speak error and those who hold to the truth. It's in the message that they teach. Listen to what's said in verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Folks, you find somebody who teaches against the person and work of Christ. They take away from his person and work. They declare error concerning his person and work. That is proof that they are not from God. Likewise, an organization, you show me a group meeting together, I don't care if they call themselves a church or not. If they're teaching error about who Christ is and what he has done for us, they are not an assembly of the Lord. Paul goes on and explains at the end of verse number 3, No man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. He's saying, look, for a person to stand up and to proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord over all, that would include his deity, that would include his work and the results of his work. For a person to be able to declare that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and then to prove it by living according to his commands, that person is genuinely from the Lord. And likewise, an assembly that stands and teaches truth about Jesus and his lordship, and then seeks to practice only what the Lord tells them to practice, that is a sign of a true church of the Lord. Folks, it's important to understand that when a, an individual or an assembly declares Jesus is Lord, not only is that done through their mouth, but it's through their actions as well. So by following the instructions the Lord has given to them, that's proof they believe Jesus is their Lord. So if you have somebody standing up teaching God's word, they should be practicing holy living. Why? 
That proves to everyone they believe Jesus is their Lord because he's following his commands for their lives. What about a local assembly? They should be seeking to fulfill the instructions God has given to them. They should practice God's word. The practices found in, in God's word should be found in that local assembly. What's that prove? That the local assembly as a body believes that Jesus is their Lord. So Paul begins here in this chapter explaining to us. This chapter is going to be about discerning between that which is genuine, that which comes from the Lord, and that which is fake. He goes on now to explain, and if you notice down in verse number uh, 27 of this same chapter, and again I'm skipping so much for the sake of time, but here in verse number 27 he gives a list of some other marks that the Lord gave to his local assemblies to prove that his local assemblies are his chosen house of worship. Listen to what's said. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Here he calls the local church a body. He says, local church, you're like a body. Okay, why does he compare a local church to a body? Let's talk about our human bodies for just a minute. When you see my hands move or when you hear my lips speak, What's causing my hands to move or what's causing my lips to speak? My hands and my lips are following the instructions given to them by the head, the brain. The only reason why my hands are moving like this is because my brain is telling my fingers to move like that. When Paul describes a local church as a body, one of the big points he's bringing out is this. The local church should fulfill the instructions of their head just like our body obeys the instructions of the brain. Who is the head of the local assembly? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is this. A local assembly, if it's really God's house of worship, they're going to recognize Jesus is their head and they're going to want to fulfill the commandments that Jesus has given to them. It goes even farther though. Stop again and think about our human body. Our human body is made up of many different parts. Lungs, kidneys, liver, stomach. Again, hands, fingers, arms, legs, eyes, ears, nose. Our body is made up of many different parts. And those parts play a different role. And yet, what's true about all of those parts of our bodies? All of the parts of our bodies are working for the good of the body as a whole. My heart, when it beats blood, it's doing it for the good of all my body. Every bit of my body needs that blood circulating. So when my heart beats, it's doing it for the good of my body as a whole. When my lungs breathe, it takes in oxygen. All of my body needs oxygen. So my lungs are doing its work for the good of the body as a whole. Even though my lungs do a different work than my heart, they're both doing their own particular job for the good of the body. That's exactly how a local church should work. You have individual members that make up the local church body. Those individual members we're going to see are given differing gifts from the Lord. But when those local church members observe those gifts and when they practice those gifts in the assembly they're doing it for the good of the entire body the whole if if the member of the local church is in the will of the lord and if they're exercising the gifts that god wants them to exercise you know what's going to happen the whole body is going to benefit from that one member's gifts so I want you to see those are two great reasons why Paul here describes a local church as a body. Now he goes on then. He begins to give us a listing of some of the gifts that God gave to the local church when it was first being formed. When it was first being established on the, on the earth. And the reason why the Lord did this was to prove to everybody that yes, the local church is his chosen house of worship. I mean, think about it. Before 
the Jews worshipped in the tabernacle and later in the temple. This local church thing was entirely different. Before, in the Old Testament, the message always coming from the tabernacle and the temple was, there's a Messiah that is yet to come. Now the message of the local church is, the Messiah has already come, and he's died on the cross for your sins. Think about the difference between the Old Testament type of worship that involved the sacrifices and all the ceremonial laws and the New Testament type of worship that takes place in a, in a local church. Entirely different. They all center on Christ and worshiping Him, but in many ways they are entirely different. So you can see how it might have been hard for people living in the New Testament times to accept the local church as God's ordained worship place. It was hard for them to really come into agreement that yes, that Messiah that they've been told all these years is to come, oh, he's come now. It was hard for them to accept these things as truths. And so the Lord gave these miracle gifts to the people back then to prove to them, look, even though the worship you see in the local church is different from what you're used to, that's what I've chosen as my house of worship, the local church. And you know, even though that message of the local church is different from the message you've heard in, in the Old Testament, that's still my message. And that's proven by these gifts that the Lord gave. Listen to what's said in verses 28 through 31. And the Lord has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do I interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. Here you can see basically what the Lord is saying is this. I have given you a variety of gifts and a variety of offices in the local church for the local church's good. It's for them to benefit from, and it's also to prove to others, my church is my chosen place of worship, and the message of my church is my chosen message to be proclaimed to the world. So even though we have a differing number of gifts, and we have a differing number of offices, and, so, and a differing time periods when these gifts were in effect, they still all come from the same Lord, and that's important to understand. So we should never get in the mindset that, well, because there's different gifts, there must be different Lords at work. Not at all. Or we don't want to get it in our time frame or in our minds that because there's different time frames when certain gifts existed, that that means there's different lords involved. Not at all. The gifts that God gave to accredit the local assembly and her message are differing, varied gifts that existed in differing, varied time periods, and yet the Lord was in control of it all, and they were gifts that came from him with the express purpose once again to build up that local church as it was beginning and also to accredit that local church proving that local church was his chosen house of worship. Do you want to see a listing of those gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11 gives us a listing of the, lo of the gifts of the local assembly. Listen to what's said. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the, by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse type, kinds of tongues. And to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worked one in the self same Spirit. Dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay folks you can see how these a variety of different gifts with different purposes was given to the local church as they first began to come into existence and began to spread throughout the globe. Once again, why did the Lord give them these gifts? For the good of the assembly, that the members might minister to one another in the assembly, but also it was to accredit those assemblies, to prove that the local church was God's house of worship and her message was God's chosen message to take to the world. <clears throat> we can break down these gifts into three basic divisions. 
The first division is gifts involving the revelation of truth. That involves the gifts of the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. What are we talking about there? The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. <clears throat> if you take the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation and you look through and you read all of the Bible, you're going to find there's two basic types of information found in the Bible. Truths about God, we can call that knowledge, and then a how to practically apply those truths to our lives. You know, the practical living teachings. That's wisdom. Wisdom is what? Applying God's word to our life. So what's being said is this. Back in those days, before the Bible was completed, God gave to men a gift called the word of wisdom. That was men's ability to come to an understanding of God's inspired word and to hand it to men. What was so special about those, that gift was, we had never received that word from God before. So they would be revealing new things to men that hadn't been written down before, they hadn't been received of men before. That's the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. So when you read in the Old Testament, when you read in the New Testament about godly men penning the scriptures and writing down what later we would put together and call the completed canon of scripture, they were exercising the gifts of the word of knowledge and the gifts of the word of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the word of wisdom to give us God's word. When God's word came into completion, at the end, when the Apostle John wrote Revelation 22, which is approximately 100 A.D., but it could have been as early as 97, it's back and forth with the dates, but basically 100 A.D., when the last book of the Bible was written, these gifts went out of existence. They were no longer needed. Once we received the entirety of the scriptures handed down from God to man, through a human author, there was no longer a need for those gifts because the Bible was completed. No longer would God give to mankind new revelation previously unreceived. Now, what's the difference between those gifts and a preacher standing up and preaching today? When preachers stand up and preach today, if they're doing what's right, they're going to be opening the scriptures and simply sharing with others what the Bible already says. Preachers don't reveal anything new to people anymore. I mean, all they do is take what's already been revealed in the Bible and give it to people. That wasn't what was happening back then. These people were being inspired by God and handing truth down from God that men had never received before. That's the gifts of the revelation of truth. Then there are gifts that I call the signs of the truth. Let me give you a quick list. Faith, gift of healing, working miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, all of those type of gifts. Those gifts proved that the local church had the truth. So when people exercise faith in a very special way, a miraculous type of faith, it's the type of faith that would move mountains. When they exercised that faith, it was proof to people. The message they're proclaiming, it must be the truth. Look at the miracles he's able to perform that goes against all the laws of nature. Sure, today we have the Lord performing miracles that go against the laws of nature, but the difference is he does not use human instruments to do it. Not in the same way he did back then. Same thing with like the gifts of healing, for example. Back then, the Lord gave individual human beings the ability to lay their hands on people and heal them, for example. That doesn't happen today anymore, I don't believe. The Lord still heals people, but he doesn't use human instruments like he used to back then. He heals people apart from having that human instrument of laying on of hands and healing people. That same basic principle applies to all of those gifts. The Lord still works miracles, folks, but he doesn't use the human instruments like he used to. All of those, again, were done to accredit the church and to accredit their message. They all went out of existence, too, at basically the same time frame. Basically, when the word of God was completed within just a few years, all of those type of miracles passed away. <clears throat> 
The last section, or the last classification of these miracles, I call the proclamation of truth. That involves the speaking of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. What is the, the miracle of speaking in tongues? I'll use myself as the example. I do not know any of the French language at all. I mean, maybe a word or two that, you know, I've seen in a movie or TV or something, but, but I don't know how to speak French. I don't. If the Lord gave me the gift of tongues, here's what would happen. I would stand up from the pulpit and I would preach in French, even though I don't know the French language. The reason why the Lord would give me that gift was because there would be people out in, in the audience, out in the congregation, that could not speak English, but they could speak French. So the only way that I can get the word of God across to them would be by speaking in a language they know. So the Lord would give me the ability to speak in French to give the message of God's word to those who only spoke French. That's what the gift of tongues is all about. You can see that in Acts chapter 2. You can see that in other places where the gift of tongues is exercised. That's what the biblical gift of tongues is. What a miracle. Can you imagine people witnessing that? <clears throat> Man, we can hear in our own language what's being spoken, and we know those guys can't speak it, and yet we hear them in that language. The interpretation of tongues, the same basic idea. It's the ability of being able to interpret a language that you previously didn't know. You're able to interpret it and put it into a human language that's understandable to the hearers. In every case, though, both in the speaking of tongues and the interpretation of tongues, only human languages were involved. Now, folks, these teachings get into a lot of detail that I can't cover right now in this video and in this series. If you go to my website, if you go to my blog, settledinheaven.wordpress.com, I've got much more material on these verses and these gifts where I get into great detail about these things. So if you still have questions after this series on some of the particulars about some of this teaching, especially in this area of accrediting the church and spiritual gifts and the gift of tongues and all that type of thing, please go to my blog and see all the information I have there. I have both written blog postings and other videos that you can access to get into much more detail about these things. But for now, the idea is this. The gift of tongues has passed away as well. Here's why. If you study closely in the Bible, the gift of tongues could only be handed down by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Folks, the last apostle, John, died again in approximately 100 A.D. Once the Apostle John died in 100 A.D., there were no more Apostles left to pass the gift down. So what you had was this. Let's say that John actually died literally on 100 A.D. I'm not sure if that's the exact year, but let's say he did. Okay, John died in 100 A.D. Anyone that he had passed the gift of tongues down to, they would continue to live after his death for a while maybe. So you might have guys living another 20 years or 30 years who have been given the gift of tongues through the laying on of hands of John. They would continue to speak the tongues language, maybe 110 A.D., 120 A.D., but eventually those people would die. When they ended up dying, there was no one left to hand the gift down from because the apostles had previously died. So the idea is this. Once you have the apostles dying, and then the other speakers of tongues gradually dying off, there was no way to replenish that group of people, and so the tongues died in and of themselves shortly after 100 AD, give or take maybe 20 years, depending on, again, how long those people lived after the apostle John's death. So the gift of tongues just died off in and of themselves. What's taking place nowadays? Again, I ask you to please go to my blog. I cover all of that. What I believe is taking place. I do not believe what's taking place in today's time concerning tongues and the miraculous type of healings that's done and all that business. I don't believe that's of the Lord at all. And I get into much more why I don't believe it and what I believe is actually taking place. 
in those other lessons but I just don't have the time it, it I don't want to get started down that road because there's a lot of teaching involved I just don't want to get into for this series but the point is I do not believe that they're of the Lord and I think it's something that Christians have to really really be careful about there's another resource you might want to uh, access in October John MacArthur is having a conference called the strange fire conference where he's going to get into much of the same idea of why what, what we see today that's being described as miraculous gifts from God really aren't. So if you want to look at Grace to You website, I think it's gty.org, John MacArthur's website, and again, look at the conference postings they have. That's October of 2013 when they're having the conference. And I've already seen what they're basically going to cover in a lot of it. And they're going to cover the same type of ideas explaining why what we see today as far as miracles of the Lord are not truly miracles of the Lord. They're counterfeit and they're harmful to Christianity in general. And you'll see why when you go there. Lastly, I would like us to look at one more thing. The longer that I've studied the accrediting of the Lord's church, the more that I've seen things in the Old Testament that align themselves with the New Testament idea of accrediting as well. Let me very quickly give you a list <clears throat> of the different places, the different houses of worship the Lord has ordained throughout history and how he accredited them. The first house of worship the Lord ordained was the tabernacle. What was basically the message being spoken by those who worshipped at the tabernacle? Basically, it was the Old Testament books known as the Law. Genesis through Deuteronomy. For the most part, that's the writings of God that was used to worship during the time of the tabernacle. How did the Lord accredit the tabernacle and how did he accredit the books of the Law to prove to everybody the tabernacle and the books of the Law were his? He raised up two men named Moses and Joshua. During those two men's ministries, during Moses and Joshua's ministry, for approximately 70 years, they performed miracles that proved they were God's men ministering in God's assembly, speaking the truths of God. Again, roughly speaking, the dates that Moses and Joshua ministered was roughly 1530 B.C. to 1460 B.C. Now, depending on what source you use for the dates, you might find these years shift one way or the other, but pretty much everybody is in agreement it was about a 70-year period. It's just it might have taken place earlier in history or later in history, depending on what the... Uh, what a certain person's chronology might come up with as far as the actual numbers. But basically, people are in agreement. For about 70 years, you have Moses and Joshua ministering. And during their ministry, they were performing miracles that proved the tabernacle and the books of the law were God's. The next house of worship the Jews worshipped in was the temple. For the most part, what portions of God's word did they use to worship in the temple? Well, that would have been, again, the books of the law, but the, also the message of the prophets, the poetical books. Pretty much all of the Old Testament was being used in one way or another to worship. You know, the message was being retained by the people. They were honoring God through those messages. So basically, between the tabernacle and the temple... The entire Old Testament was being used to worship the Lord. How did the Lord accredit the temple and the, the, the remaining portions of the Old Testament? How did he do that? There were two men that he raised up named Elijah and Elisha. Once again, those men in particular, uh, the prophet Isaiah was a part of the group as well. There were a few others who did perform miracles, but in general it was Elijah and Elisha that performed a tremendous number of miracles during that time period. Those miracles were used to accredit the temple and the Old Testament scriptures. And once again, guess basically how long that accreditation lasted. From 835 B.C. to 675, or 765 B.C. Let me say that again. 835 to 765 B.C. Again, basically 70 years. 
So based on the pattern of the Old Testament, it seems like when the Lord accredits his house of worship and the message that comes forth out of that house of worship, he did it in 70 year increments. And then there would be silence as far as miracles go in between. Okay, let's turn our attention out of the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Lord establishes a local church. What's the message that basically comes forth out of the local church? It's the message of the New Testament. How did the Lord accredit the worship of the, in the local church and its message? Through the use of Christ and his apostles. They're the ones that basically did the miracle working in the New Testament. For how long? Christ's ministry began in 30 A.D. Like I said, there's many people that believe basically the Apostle John died in 100 A.D. 70 years. <clears throat> so you can see how the Lord was consistent. Every time he ordains a new house of worship, and every time he ordains a message that he gives to man, 70 years of accreditation takes place. That was true with the tabernacle and the book of the law. That was true with the temple and the remaining portion of the Old Testament. And that was true with the local church and the New Testament. 70 years each time. That's just one other reason among many why I say please be careful. What you see taking place around you today is not necessarily the biblical gifts that people claim they are. It would break the pattern God has set of a 70 year accreditation period for each time he raises up a new house of worship and gives more of his revelation to man. Once again I want to thank you very much for joining us in our study. Again, if you have any questions about what I've gone over, there's much more information to be found in my blog. There's much more information to be found on the YouTube videos I've put out. There's much more information you can find. Again, from MacArthur's is another one just off the top of my head. And I'm sure there's other sound websites where you can get good, valuable information about this. Folks, I want to thank you so very much for joining me in this study. May the Lord bless you as you study His Word.